As a child growing up in an old world Italian family, I could not help but equate food with love. As an adult, little did I know that cooking and baking with and for my family would not only nourish our bodies, but also comfort me through my worst nightmare. This is my son, William. Isn't he just like the handsomest guy you've ever seen in your life? I'm so proud to be his mom. William was born to be in the military. At the age of five, while we vacationed on a San Diego beach, he was mesmerized by a group of Navy SEALs out in the water performing their maneuvers. It was then and there he declared that one day he would grow up and become one of those guys. A voracious reader, he read every book on the subject and trained himself in the woods on the edge of our property. <laughs> Dressed in camouflage and often drenched in mud, he would emerge from the woods, delighting me with his tales of evading hikers on the trail or making me cringe with the thought of him eating ants as a means of survival sustenance. <laughs> He'd say, Mom, do you know ants are sour? <laughs> William never wavered from his mission, and he learned he was colorblind so he could not become a Navy SEAL. So he chose to be a corpsman. He graduated at the top of his class. He was a brave and fearless healer and considered the best of the best. William was home already six months from his tour in Afghanistan. He had been fired upon. He had saved lives. He even was traveling in a vehicle blown up by one of those explosive devices, those hidden explosive devices. He came home unscathed, not a scratch. So how could he be dead now as a result of sleep deprivation? Sleep deprivation, was this a preventable accident? The question haunted me. Initially, my biggest fear when William died was that people would forget him or that I would grow old and one day forget him. So I immediately created a slideshow to be shared at his funeral and a short time later a photo book to be shared with a few of his closest friends. Was that enough to celebrate a life? My grief continued it wasn't over in three weeks or even six months. In my story, it's a myth that it ever ends. Many people, from doctors to widows, use the cooler off stages of death and dying as a means of understanding grief. But I did not quite see it this way. My first year was full on numb. My heart, my brain, they were shattered. I felt more like a robot on autopilot, just going through my day, doing those normal activities. After two weeks of bereavement leave, I did what was expected of me, and I returned to work. On the surface, I looked perfectly fine, but on the inside, I knew that I was just a hot mess, a sad hot mess. Year two, I call my year of anger. I woke up from that one-year coma, realizing my son was truly gone. I did a lot of screaming in year two. The anger was something I had to go through. It was like walking through a fire, just keep on going and just hope you come out whole. And I needed to blame someone for my loss, so I took on the Navy. My cause was to never let this sleep-deprived situation happen to another. 
I wrote letters to everyone in charge, and then some. In my letters, I included scientific evidence that likened sleep deprivation to being legally drunk. Doctors, pilots, even bus drivers, they have sleep requirements prior to performing their jobs. I wondered, how are those in the military, those in charge of the safety of our sons and daughters, how did they not know this stuff? How is it that my son, who only received a few hours of sleep over a span of a week, sleep-deprived training as part of a scout sniper program, how is he given permission to drive rather than be ordered to bed? I'm telling you, if it was a mom in charge, he would have had his pajamas on and he would have been in bed, not getting in a car to drive off somewhere. To my surprise, those I wrote to respond. They thank me for my perseverance in championing a cause to ensure the safety of our sailors. And in a final note from Rear Admiral Norton, with William in mind, the efforts will continue to try and combat risk. Now, through my anger, I could hear William's voice. He was saying, Mom, could you just please stop screaming and get over this? And there were other signs of my son, one of the most memorable being this heart-shaped rock. Now, exercise is really good for those who are grieving. So on a particularly sad day, I ventured alone on a walk in the woods, and as I stepped on the path, I saw this rock. And as I reached for it, I felt this bear hug and brace, like the kind he used to give me. I actually turned, thinking I might see him on the path. I felt his presence, but I thought I was nuts. I didn't believe in ghosts or angels, and chalked up the experience to me being totally out of my mind with grief. I did not share the incident with anyone. Approaching year three, I had another sign from William in the shape of a chocolate chip cookie. For those of you who don't know, I have been a competitive home cook for about 30 years, a very successful one, and all my winning recipes are inspired by those I love most. So on another sad day, I decided to get into the kitchen, pull out my mixing bowls, and create Sweet William's inspired and spirited chocolate chip cookies. The spirit being him, but also a little Jack Daniels in the mix because he liked it. <laughs> now the smell of that melting chocolate and that whiff of Jack Daniels coming from the oven completely elevated my mood. I went from being sad to glad. It was a revelation. The cooking, the baking, my food, it was love made edible. Now, remember that heart-shaped rock and that bear hug embrace? Well, the same thing happened with the cookie. I use a cookie scoop to measure out my cookie dough. It ensures that every cookie bakes up perfectly round. Yet this is what the cookie looked like, the one closest to my hand as I pulled those cookies from the oven. In the moment I saw that heart-shaped cookie, I felt that same bear hug embrace. I was overwhelmed with happiness. His presence just filled the room. I wondered if other grievers had similar experiences. I thought it was time to take my grief public, and the notion of a food blog hit me. I thought it would be a great way to celebrate his life, committing his memories and telling a story through my recipes on a blog. But knowing nothing about technology, not being a writer, and I certainly didn't know a thing about food photography, it was far-fetched that I could create a virtual community and share my version of grief with anyone who would care. But one thing I did know, and that is that good food and good recipes bring everybody to the table. 
In October of 2013, goodgriefcook.com was born, and that took me on so much more than a grief journey. Inspired by sharing my story, others were inspired to share theirs, and there were powerful stories of healing, like that of Patrice. Patrice transforms once-loved wedding dresses into these angel gowns to be shared with babies that die prematurely. Betty is an elderly woman who, 60 years later, still gets tears in her eyes at the mention of her dead child's name, reminding us that grief doesn't always end. Krista, through the support of the blog, found the courage to speak publicly on behalf of organ donation, celebrating her son, Aiden. And then there's Marcy. Marcy reads the blog, too. She creates these gorgeous felted stones and leaves them wherever she goes for strangers to find, honoring her son, Harrison. We shared the same deep sorrow, the same crazy anger, and we learned some things, that we are not alone and that the tides of grief are common in normal experiences. But what I wondered most was, did they feel the presence of those they had loved and lost? And the answer is a thunderous yes. Now for me, I wanted to continue to celebrate William's life, and the only way for me to do that was to follow in his light. William was brave, often followed the road less traveled, stepping outside his comfort zone. I wanted to do the same, so I did the next logical thing. I applied to be on the Food Network show Chopped. <laughs> the thought of being on TV, preparing a basket of mystery ingredients under a time constraint, was terrifying to me. Not as terrifying as a TEDx talk, but terrifying. <laughs> They get thousands of applications, so I thought the chances of me being cast were pretty slim. Until a moment in a Skype interview with the TV producers. I was telling them about that heart-shaped chocolate chip cookie when suddenly their eyes got big and their jaws dropped open, and they said, you are not going to believe the way we see you through the screen. There's a reflection off the window behind you, and there is a heart over your head. My response, oh, that's just William cheering me on. He really wants me to be on the show. I was cast, I competed, and I won the Mother's Day episode in 2014. In uh, the dessert round, I created a version of those chocolate chip cookies. And in those final seconds, as I waited for Ted Allen to say, stop cooking, I was getting a bear hug so tight, I thought my heart would explode. And from an ugly tragedy comes something good. Just a few short months ago, the Navy announced new regulations to prevent sleep deprivation accidents. I'd like to think that my call for action so many years ago had a little something to do with it. One day, grief is going to knock at your door. And when it does, I gently urge you to find the courage to do something positive with it. There are so many things you can do. For me, it's through cooking and blogging and baking. But there's also Memorial Bench, school scholarship, a fun run, fundraiser for the heroes. And from my heart to yours, a recipe and a cookie, which you can pick up as you leave the conference today. Thank you.